Welcome, welcome to Pomona College. My name is David Oxtoby, president of the college. On behalf of both Pomona and Harvey Mudd College, I want to welcome all of you to Bridges Auditorium to spend some time with one of America's great visionaries, entrepreneurs, and philanthropists, Bill Gates. Of course, of course, here at Pomona, Bill is better known as the big brother of our own Libby Armentrout, class of 1986, and a trustee of the college, who I'm happy to say is also with us this afternoon. The rest of the world, however, knows Bill for a few other things, such as co-founding Microsoft Corporation, building it into a personal computing powerhouse, or improving the lives of the world's most disadvantaged people as co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Most of you already know the story, so I won't belabor it. Bill was an undergraduate at Harvard in the early 70s when he developed a version of the basic programming language for the very first personal computer. He was a junior when he left Harvard to devote his full energies to the company he and his childhood friend, Paul Allen, had founded. And as they say, the rest is history. Over the years, as Microsoft's chairman, CEO, and chief software architect, Bill has been the driving force behind the company's phenomenal success and innovative genius. In 2008, he left his day-to-day -day role with Microsoft to focus on his other abiding interest, philanthropy. Founded in 2000, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is one of the world's largest transparently operated foundations. Maintaining that all lives have equal value no matter where they are lived, the foundation has had an enormous impact around the world in the areas of global health including HIV AIDS, education, libraries, agriculture. Joining Bill on stage is Maria Clave, president of Harvey Mudd College, who will serve as host for this afternoon's conversation. A renowned computer scientist and scholar, Maria was named president of Harvey Mudd in 2006 and is the first woman to lead the college. Pri Prior to joining HMC, she served as Dean of Engineering and Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University. She's a member of the board of Microsoft Corporation, a board member of Math for America, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. At the end of their conversation, we will open the discussion to take questions from students. Before we begin, I'd like to take just a moment to recognize a few people who have helped to make this event possible. This conversation with Bill Gates is co-sponsored by the Harvey Mudd College Annenberg Leadership and Management Speakers Series and the Pomona College Distinguished Speakers Series. For Pomona, I would like to thank Pomona parents, Pat and Paula Bro, and their daughter Kiki, Pomona class of 09, who are with us today for making this Distinguished Speakers Series possible over the past three years. And on behalf of Harvey Mudd College, I want to thank the Annenberg Foundation, which has provided generous support for the Annenberg Leadership and Management Speaker Series. Howard DeShong, a trustee of Harvey Mudd College in class of 89, and his mother, Diane DeShong, who are Annenberg family members, are also with us this afternoon. Now, on behalf of Pomona College and Harvey Mudd College, I'm delighted to present Bill Gates and Maria Clave. Wow, it's really dark out there. <laughs> we can't see a thing. Bill, um, I want to start by just saying thank you for spending the day with us. Um, you have made so many of our students and our faculty and our alumni really excited to have you here. And I just have to ask you, what struck you about your interactions with the students and faculty from Pomona College and Harvey Mudd College? Well, it's great to see uh, the energy, the optimism. I got to see some poster sessions uh, which involved real research work being done at the undergraduate level. And several of the projects, you know, I think uh, will succeed in having a, a, a meaningful impact. So the depth of work that's being done 
uh, you know, I'd normally think of that as, as graduate work, but the kind of uh, special energy those kids put into it. Uh, and just to see a high quality institution of learning and, you know, when it works, how well it works, that you get professors who like having great kids, you get great kids who like having great professors. It's nice to see that, uh, you know, one of the great assets of the United States, many things being, being challenged and uh, top, but one of the great assets is the higher education system, including institutions like the ones here. So makes me uh, optimistic about the future. Uh, well, that's the way we want you to be. <laughs> <laughs> because you're actually somebody who is working really hard to make the future of the world in many different ways much more positive. So I wanted to start out by you know, just asking you, as you look around the world, uh, you travel to uh, developed and developing nations uh, all the time. What are the things that you're most optimistic about, in addition to the Claremont Colleges, of course? <laughs> and what are you most concerned about? Well, the, the thing I think it's often missed is, over the last 100 years, or 200 years, the innovation to improve the human condition has been phenomenal whether it's food production, uh, medicine. You know, people are living over twice as long as they did 200 years ago. Uh, 200 years ago, the infant mortality, about 40% of all children would not live to see the age to be five years old. And now on a, a world, worldwide basis, that's down to about 7%. And so it's, it's a huge improvement. And time is on our side, that is, you know, we will invent new vaccines, we will um, improve the way learning gets done. Uh, so innovation, I think, is greatly underestimated. And sometimes innovation doesn't uh, focus on the needs of the poorest, the, the seeds, the medicines. Um, I was pretty stunned when our foundation got involved in malaria and with actually some pretty small grants, we became the biggest funder of work on a malaria vaccine. So. In terms of things that are concerning, you know, we always need to keep in mind that things don't naturally get spread around. Uh, that is, the, the, the people who should benefit the most from innovation, the poorest two billion on the planet, uh, we have to take special measures to make that happen because it is sometimes depressing to go to some of these tough countries and see that just getting food and very basic things we take for granted uh, in health uh, if you have bad health, ironically, you have very high population growth. And so we still have many parts of the world where you have 3.5% uh, to 4% population growth. Uh, for example, in Pakistan, northern Nigeria, there's no way that you'll be able to provide enough food. So you're, you're, whatever you care about, uh, stability, education, the environment, you're creating a, a situation that really you're not going to achieve any of those goals. So we've got to We've got to do the things, and health is the key one to get that population growth down. In terms of, you know, I think there is a lot of concern in the U.S. right now about, uh, you know, are we as much of a leader as we should be? Um, you know, will we be able to fund the future with the liabilities we have in terms of uh, health care and, and pensions and things like that? I, I tend to be optimistic about that, even though those are some very, very tough, uh, tough problems. But... You know, the U.S.'s relative position won't uh, be as strong as it was, but that's probably a, a good thing. We'll be richer and richer every year, and everyone will, will live a, a better lifestyle than, than in the past. So one of the things that you said in uh, your annual letter from the Gates Foundation, which um, I just want to comment, the fact that you put a handwritten note on the front of the letter I got, I walked around Harvey Mudd College getting it. Bill wrote to me, look at this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was a big deal. But I sit with Bill in meetings and I know he handwrites all the time in meetings and so I know that you probably sent out 400 of those notes, but still, mm -hmm. I was really happy to get mine. But in your letter, which I loved, you said you're willing to be a troublemaker when it comes to making a progress on AIDS internationally. So, um, being a troublemaker myself, I was wondering exactly what did you have in mind? <laughs> well, AIDS is a you know, tragic disease that uh, is still killing over two million people a year and uh, is still several million people getting infected every year. 
And what happened was that when triple drug therapy, sometimes called HART or ART or ARV type therapy, was invented, for the rich countries, it meant the problem was largely solved. I mean, it was expensive. You don't, you don't want to be on those drugs, but your life expectancy is not dramatically reduced. And so the urgency of coming up with a, a cure of some type or a vaccine that would prevent the disease went way down. In fact, you know, selling those, those ARV drugs is, is, is big business and government's been, been willing to fund it in the rich countries. Now, in the poorest countries where 85% of the cases are, they will not have enough money to do that. And so there's just not enough urgency about getting a vaccine or getting uh, other tools for prevention. And what happens is the poor countries don't trust their own regulatory authorities to approve uh, any new approaches. So they wait for the United States or European regulatory authorities. Well, those authorities, are, they're good people, but they've created a system that is very tuned to being cautious. You know, the default answer is no, and the default time frame is long. Uh, and, of course, we suspended those rules and did things in a special way when AIDS was in this country, and we got the AIDS drugs through in about a two- or three-year process, which is uniquely quick for an FDA approval. Now, for all these other tools that the poorest countries need, we're looking at huge delays and very complex protocols uh, that, to make sure that there's absolutely no harm done in these things. So it's going to take way longer than it should to get, uh, to get the tools in place. And it's not because any one person understands that. It's just these systems weren't designed to solve this problem. And so, you know, it's possible that uh, informing people or uh, uh, giving people credit if they do shorten the thing, it's possible that some form of leadership could get the, the speed of a new vaccine getting out or a microbicide, it's a gel um, that a woman can use to protect herself in a, a covert way. It's actually done and ready, uh, but the question is, will it be out in use? Uh, best case would be three years, or will it be 10 years? And normal course, uh, it'll be 10 years before that's, that's used broadly. So, you know, it, it matters in terms of millions, millions of lives. So how do you do that? I mean, how do, what is it that you can actually do that will take it from 10 to 3? Well, the, we can, that kind of gets into the specifics of this one, uh, but maybe it's a, a good illustration. In the rich world, when we approve a drug, you're kind of done because you assume that you can afford it. You assume you just go to the drugstore, get your prescription, and that you've, you're fairly compliant in terms of taking that drug. In poor countries, you don't have that kind of infrastructure. You, the supply chain's not as good. The compliance is not going to be as good. You can't go see a doctor. Um, the ability to deal with side effects is not going to be as good because you don't have medical personnel. So actually, the design of products for the developing world is more stringent than for the rich world. And the costs have to also be lower. And so it's kind of a tough thing. You know, for vaccines, as soon as the rich world gets them down to like 40 or 50 dollars, they just leave them there. In fact, the last thing you want to do is tinker with something to make it cheaper because then you're going to have to go through a whole new regulatory cycle. But for the developing world, you've got to get those things down to a dollar or less. And, um, you know, so the, it, it, the rich world is no longer helping you do that. Um, here on this, this microbicide, you... That that's the, the gel a woman would use to protect herself. The problem you have is you don't just want to make it broadly available because if somebody's only partially compliant, they may get infected, and then if you're using this uh, intervention, it's like being on a single drug, drug therapy, which means that you would create resistant strains of AIDS that not only would hurt you, but then could spread in the community. So you have to combine getting this gel available to women with a, a regime that they get tested so you find breakthrough cases pretty rapidly. So the, the way they've split it up, they do a trial for the drug and then they wake up and say, oh no, now we need to do a delivery trial. Well, they wait two years to start that and then that takes three years. Well, 
all these things should be done at once, they should be done in parallel, but the US FDA process doesn't understand about community trials with these delivery techniques. They, they've never needed those, it's not interesting right. for them. So there literally is no regulatory agency in the world that is appropriate for this, and so you kind of have to cobble things together um, and find some brave countries that understand that it's their citizens who are dying, they're sovereign, don't expect the U.S. to move fast or lead the way on this. So essentially what you're doing is educating the countries where the major problems are to try to get them to put in place the right kind of evaluation of therapies that would work for that country. Right, because trickle-down won't work for this. It, trickle-down works for a lot of things. It's too slow, it's too expensive, but for this it won't even work at all because what you need is, is novel uh, and not, not at all needed in the United States. So while I've got you, I'm going to uh, shuffle questions around because while I've got you on, you know, spending, thinking about global health and d d disease eradication, you know, obviously polio is something you put a huge amount of time, money, energy into. And, you know, polio, you know, I guess I still went to school with people who had had polio, but I'm really old. So, you know, I think most of our students, unless they came from another country, they don't really don't know about polio. So I wondered if you could say something about why is it important to eradicate this disease worldwide? Yeah, polio is a great story because all the research was funded in the 1950s by citizens making lots and lots of small contributions through what was called the March of Dimes. And that was popularized by Franklin Roosevelt, who was a uh, polio uh, patient and, you know, crippled, couldn't walk. And he personally helped get the March of Dimes going and then uh, a lot of Hollywood stars came in. So it was not financed by the federal government. It was all this March of Dimes created actually two vaccines, one of which is an oral drop vaccine called the Salk, uh, vac the Sabin vaccine, and then the original one was a shot, which is the Salk vaccine. So by the end of the 1960s, we had eliminated polio from the United States. And it wasn't until 1988 that the world decided, okay, let's, uh, at that time, uh, there were about 300,000 kids a year either dying or being crippled, mostly being crippled. What happens is it attacks the nerve cells, and so you, you lose all your muscles. If it attacks the um, nerve cells that control the muscles in your diaphragm, then you can't breathe and you die uh, unless you're put into an iron lung. And so if you look at the historical pictures of polio, the sort of iconic picture is a sea of, of kids in these iron lungs uh, that... that are keeping them alive. So starting at that point in 1988, um, there were 125 countries that had the disease. Um, now we're down to four where it's never been stopped. Now those four, Nigeria, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, people travel out of those countries and reinfect other countries. But we've been able to do the clean, the mop up in those reinfections pretty well. It's really the hard thing is these four. And we're down to now less than 3,000 cases a year. And with any luck, we need little luck, in three or four years, this will become the second disease ever eradicated. Now, this is my the thing I spend the most time on because it comes at a tough time in terms of government budgets. Uh, I was just back in Washington, D.C. the last two days. Uh, and, you know, amidst the size of the cuts being made, the little $130 million for polio, you know, may, may get cut. You know, the vaccine money gig may get cut, so I was begging uh, uh, for that. Our foundation spends twice what the U.S. government does, but the, the big problem is if the U.S. government cuts... <laughs> As you said, That's it's nice. a friendly cut. <laughs> yeah, <crowd. very. laughs> If the U.S. government cuts, then the European governments will feel like they have an excuse or a reason to cut. And unfortunately, if... If we don't get enough money, then it spreads back in a way that would make it very, very expensive to ever go and tackle this thing. So we have sort of a one-time opportunity. Despite all this financial pressure, we still, still need to, to do it. So what was your sense after your conversations in Washington 
you going to... That's a very complicated situation because you have... There's a true schizophrenia where if you say to voters, you know, do you think the federal government spends too much money and they should spend less? They say, yeah, absolutely. Then you name specific things like uh, Pell Grants for students, and they say, no, not that. Uh, how about NIH, medical research funding? No, you really shouldn't cut that. And pretty soon, you prove that what the American public is against is arithmetic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And so what you have is, you have people who are making the point that we have an unsustainable situation, and you have other people making a point that the part of the budget that really renews our excellence, that supports the young, and that helps the poorest, is this thing called the, the discretionary non-defense part, which is 500 billion out of 3.7 trillion. So it's a fairly small part, but all the attack, the some people have a goal of taking that 500 billion and getting it down to 400 billion. And so your research money, your education money, your, your things where you help the poor with medicine and agriculture, it's all in there. Um, the big problem in the budget is actually in other places, which are, are primarily the medical costs, the growth of the medical costs, um, and the size of the defense budget, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't resist. Um, do you think we should have universal health care in the United States? <laughs> it wasn't a planned question. The, we have a, our health care system has huge problems. Uh, it's got equity problems where the, the poorest in the country, of all the rich countries, our poorest quarter get the worst health care. Uh, so the accessibility is a huge problem. We spend 17.8% of GDP. The number two, which is Switzerland, spends 12.3%. So you have, it's mind blowing, you have over a 5% of GDP difference. That means one out of every 20 people in the country are excess people in our healthcare system that other countries that get better results than we do don't have. And you, it, it's, you know, if you take uh, inefficiency disadvantage like that, and then you take how much we spend on defense versus everybody else, and how much we spend on legal stuff versus everybody else, you can start to say, wow, how do you, how do you stay competitive with those things? So our medical system has to change. Um, I happen to like the Swiss system and the German system the best, which are not a single payer uh, Canadian or British type system. But I take any rich countries medical system over ours. Ours is provably the worst. Uh, it is the most expensive and the, the least equitable. Um, now, you have to be a little careful because everybody else drafts off of us. We do a lot of the research. We do more basic research than NIH. We do, our consumers pay more for drugs. And what other countries do is they watch what happens here. And if something is cost effective, they adopt it, usually with about a three-year leg. And m m many of the things we do, including uh, care at the end of life or various therapies that are unbelievably expensive, they just don't, don't, do. don't adopt those things. So I think I have time to ask one more question before we turn it over to the audience. And I know they're going to have great questions, too. And um, so let's assume you are um, 18 or 19 years old. You're in your first year at Pomona College or Harvey Mudd College. You haven't decided what to major yet. What would you pick? Well, I think it's a hard choice. Um, if you go into medicine, then you can either become somebody who's hands-on being a great doctor, you know, in the rich world or the poor world, or you can go into inventing new vaccines uh, where your impact can be pretty phenomenal. And so it's hard to beat that. If you go into computer science, you know, you can get software to help with education, you can get uh, robots to be a real thing, you can get computers to finally be semi-intelligent. Um, and that's this exciting thing. In fact, when I dropped out to start Microsoft, the one thing that I felt bad about was I thought, well, in the next 10 years, these artificial intelligence people, you know, could make some real progress. And I would, it would be kind of a shame not to be there and be part of it. Now it turns out didn't I, I didn't miss that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's still coming. That's right. And now, you know, now actually 
the, between the universities and places like Microsoft Research, some really amazing stuff is happening, but it took a lot longer uh, for that to happen. But, you know, if you go into physics, you can contribute to new ways of making energy, ways that are inexpensive, which the poorest need, ways that don't emit CO2. Um, so I'm big on any kind of math science thing. I think there are ways to have a job that's both fun, uh, a job that's uh, you can support your family very well, and a job that you can see your impact as being pretty phenomenal. Um, so, you know, any of those math, science enabled careers, I think are, there's a lot of great opportunities. So do you think your kids are going, going to go into math science careers? Well, I'm not going to push them because uh, that can have the opposite effect. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think so. But, you know, they, they can pick whatever they want, um, and, you know, that, that'll be great. I mean, uh, someone has to do the non-math science jobs. Uh. <laughs> well, on that note... <laughs> Thank you very much. Bill Gates has agreed to take a few questions from student members of the audience. We have approximately 25 minutes. Please make your questions both brief and to the point. We have microphones, two microphones, at the front of each aisle, and we'll alternate between the two microphones. So if you want to come forward, anyone who would like to pose questions. This microphone here. First question. Um, hello. <laughs> I got a question for you. Can you get uh, your name and, and your college, perhaps. Sure. My name is Ryan Granger. I'm actually a guest here. I'm from Cal Poly Pomona. And uh, <laughs> I'm a major in civil engineering. Um, I have a question for you. I was once told that in order to get a job at Microsoft, when you interviewed, they'd ask you, why is a manhole cover around? I'd like to ask you the same question. <laughs> <laughs> well, why is a manhole cover round? And it has to do with the geometric removability. Uh, it, we don't ask that question for most of our jobs. <laughs> if you're going to work in our sanitary, sanitary engineering department, we want to know <laughs> that you understand uh, why rectangular uh, covers aren't as, as easy to, uh, to use. Now, that, you know, there's a lot of myths about job interviewing at places like uh, Microsoft and Google. We, we did do brain teasers for a while, and then we ended up backing off of that. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's done as much as it, it used to be done. Question on the other side. Uh, my name is Ian Gologli. I'm a sophomore at Pomona. Um, I'm sure you're aware there's a whole group of very wealthy people around the world who have recently signed a pledge to give away um, at least half their wealth toward charitable causes, like the pledge, I guess it's being called. Um, I think you're on that list, and Warren Buffett and others, which is obviously a good sign for, for philanthropy, but um, I'm wondering if you think this, the existence of all these billionaires with all this money to give away reflects some kind of trend in America towards income inequality, and if, if that uh, rise in income inequality you think is a, is a negative thing or or what the effects of that are. Thanks. Well, I think philanthropy is a great thing. And I do think that uh, capitalism is a, si as a system that encourages people to start new businesses and, to, and figures out how the resources in the economy should be used has been extremely successful. And part of that is allowing people to some degree to uh, accumulate quite a bit of wealth. The ideal is if those people then give it back. And the giving pledge thing you referred to is something that uh, Warren Buffett and uh, my wife Melinda and I got started after going to lots of dinners talking to philanthropists about why they give and thinking that, hey, these philanthropists ought to get together, learn from each other, 
Uh, now we've got 60 people signed up for that. Uh, that's just in the United States, and I think we'll get a lot more. Uh, and then we, incur we went over to India, went over to China and in t 10 days to India uh, to encourage them to create similar things. They'll, they'll do it in a slightly different way and it'll be created in those countries. So philanthropy is a great thing. The largest fortunes in the United States today are not as large as a percentage of the economy as, say, the Rockefeller or Carnegie uh, fortunes were. Now, I have to say the Rockefeller Foundation, which is where 95% uh, of that money went, was very enlightened. I mean, the things they funded were not popular at the time. He created Rockefeller University that did medical research. A lot of great vaccine work came out of there. Uh, he funded uh, schools uh, for black children, uh, which was truly an un unpopular cause at the time. Uh, Carnegie, of course, did libraries. He did work that got medica medical education in the US, which was the worst in the world, to actually move ahead of, of the Germans, who were the best at the time. And it you know, led to, uh, that, that was a phenomenal thing. So philanthropy can make a big difference. The, if you want to moderate income inequity, then you have to you know, have certain tax systems. My dad and I have been the two biggest proponents of the estate tax. Uh, not many people spend time promoting taxes. It does make you very popular. Uh, but you know, there are reasons I, I believe an estate tax is, is a good thing. Um, but you know, philanthropy is philanthropy in the United States is a great thing. We could have more of it. It could be even better. But we do. It is uh, unique to the United States to have as much as we have. Over here. Hi, Mr. Gates. My name is Rachel Ramirez. I'm a senior at Pomona College. Um, in 2009, I believe Microsoft endorsed the Dream Act. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about why Microsoft endorsed the Dream Act, why you think it's a worthwhile piece of legislation. Yeah, the United States has had a lot of reasons why it's done so well. Uh, our institutions of higher learning are part of that. Uh, our commitment to research funding is part of that. And our belief in risk taking, which manifests itself often in good ways and sometimes not. Uh, but venture capital, I think, is a, a very positive thing. The, another huge advantage the United States has had is that a lot of very capable people from all over the world have come to the United States. Kind of a crass way of saying that is that we're a net importer of IQ. But IQ alone doesn't really tell the full story because people who choose to leave their country and take the risk of uprooting themselves, they're not they're also kind of more energetic, more risk-taking, and so the mix of the, the native population with all these energetic, talented people who've come into the country has been part of the, the magic formula of the United States. And to the degree that we don't continue to encourage that, uh, then we're giving up one of the, the great things that we've had. This DREAM Act, the key element of it is that if you get an education here in the United States, you're immediately qualified for a green card, which means that you're allowed to stay in the United States if you choose and, and work here. And it's kind of a perverse thing that the United States helps students from other countries get a great education here, but then upon graduation, they get thrust into a very uh, quota-driven, complex, bureaucratic uh, visa process that many of them end up not being able to stay and uh, even if they want to. So DREAM Act is, you know, pretty, to me, a pretty basic uh, good idea, uh, but it, it has not become law. Hi, uh, my name is Colin. I'm a Pitzer, um, student at Pitzer College, and my question to you involves uh, the Gates Foundation in relation to agriculture in Africa currently. I know that, uh, well, initially you've spoken of having um, agricultural research, and, and while that doesn't prim exclusively refer to industrial agriculture, it primarily refers to the Green Revolution that we saw in the 60s in India, and it feels like your work, the Gates work, 
the Gates Foundation um, position in Africa has been focused on um, synthetic fertilizers and um, relationships with Monsanto. And I was wondering if you're confident with the direction the Gates Foundation is going in Africa in this regard. Yeah, we do, other than health, the biggest thing we do uh, for the poorest is uh, agricultural research. 70% uh, of the poor people in the world are farmers who have very small farms, and so all of our work is focused on helping them. The Green Revolution that you mentioned was a phenomenal thing. Uh, actually, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, funded Norman Borlaug and some other people to create these seed varieties that more than doubled productivity. And so calories per person went way up. In fact, there was a group called the Club of Rome that was predicting huge starvation in Pakistan and India and many other places. That didn't happen. didn't happen because of the Green Revolution. And as those calorie amounts went up, the, the educatability of the kids went up massively. And it, people hadn't understood that mental development was being held back by the restricted diet that had existed on the subcontinent up to that time. So you saved lives, you, you created something very positive. Now, we, we, when we're looking at doing new seeds, uh, some of our work does involve uh, uh, genetic modification technology, GMO type technology, which Monsanto is a leader in. So for example, uh, one of the problems you have in Africa is that climate change will hurt agriculture much more in those tropical areas than anywhere in the world. So you have a problem that Africans didn't create because their CO2 emissions are, are tiny, and yet because they live on the edge and they don't have buffer stocks and they don't have irrigation, because they're living on the edge, they will be the primary victims. Even by 2030, uh, their productivity will go down. I'm in a all-day seminar talking about this tomorrow. So the idea that we actually use science to come up with some new seeds that then they can decide if they want to use their sovereign countries. Uh, we've actually put tens of millions into helping them fund the regulatory groups that look uh, at any new seeds that get proposed, no matter how that seed's created, and uh, decide if they want to use them. The biggest project, the biggest single progress project, is this uh, form of corn, maize, uh, that can handle drought, that is water shortage, during the key parts of the growing cycle. And this drought resistant maize uh, project, Monsanto gave all their intellectual property for free. They get no royalties of any kind. We have over 100 African scientists working on us. It takes a long time, it'll be probably six years uh, before we actually have this. But under the drought conditions that happen about a third of the years now, and will happen because of climate change about two-thirds of the time uh, by 2030, uh, this, this corn is 40% more productive. And you know people can decide whether they, they like that or don't like that. It maps it into uh, less starvation, uh, kids whose brains are fully developed, and having a, uh, just an ability to, to create a, a stable environment. So we, we do court controversy uh, in that area, um, but that is, that is a technique that will allow the world to feed itself, which uh, without those techniques, what happens is you, bring, you use all sorts of land you shouldn't use, including burning down forests, so that then worsens the carbon problem because you're releasing CO2, and you get into this, this negative spiral. Question over here. Hi, my, my name is Hal Hargrave, um, University of Laverne. Uh, I'm a freshman over there. I'm 21 years old. Um, I had a question for you. Um, I'm kind of glad tonight pertained a lot to, towards healthcare and diseases and whatnot. Um, four years ago, I sustained a spinal cord injury, and this is a population that 450,000 Americans live with, uh, 11,000 new, 11, new injuries a year. but. Um, shortly after that, um, I wanted to be philanthropic myself. I started my own foundation, very small scale compared to what you do, but <laughs> <laughs> um, more or less, um, it's community um, funded. Um, it's supported entirely by Claremont, great people here, but my question to you was, how, does, how do I take my foundation to the next level? I'm a young kid um, looking for um, just 
you know, opportunities, but um, want to hear from you what, what your take on it is. And before you say that, I just want to let you know in the last three years, this young man has raised over $800,000 that's gone back to every person. Well, that's, that's quite impressive. Uh, that's bigger than the average foundation already. Uh, no, it's a tough time to be raising money, and there are so many worthwhile causes uh, in health and education um, in the United States, outside the United States. I do think that foundations do best when they focus in on very few problems. And so our foundation, although it's quite large, uh, we, you know, we're reasonably narrow in what we do because we're trying to have big impact in those areas. So, um, you know, I, I think that is, is advice that I'd give to you. And in terms of going to the next level, it's getting the story out. And, you know, people want to hear about success. They want to hear about effectiveness. You know, how many dollars did you spend to get a certain outcome? And philanthropy in general has been pretty soft on uh, talking through these metrics and being willing to compare. And, you know, that's going to be all the more important. One of the big challenges is that state budgets are so messed up. A lot of things where you've had state dollars come in, where the state's either done something or funded something, a lot of that's going to go down. So as you're you know, looking at your next few years, you know, try and see what, uh, what's going on with these state health budgets, uh, how that might affect the people that you're, you're trying to help. Um, you know, so and you're off to a good start. I, I didn't do any philanthropy until I was uh, in my late 40s. Good. Over here. Um, hi, I'm Ellie Schofield. I go to Harvey Mudd College. I'm a math major there. Um, oh, awesome. <laughs> uh, and I was curious, so I'm, you just mentioned that there are a ton of really amazing causes right now to support. And as an undergraduate, I'm really enthusiastic about a lot of those causes, but money isn't a resource I have in abundance at the moment. Um, <laughs> But I do have time and energy, or at least I will in a couple of years once I've finished up this major. And I'm really, <laughs> apparently I'm just bringing the laughs today. Okay, um, but I really want to figure out where can I best invest that time and energy right now to really help out with those causes before I necessarily have money at my fingertips to invest further. Yeah, I think the ideal is to pick something and learn a fair bit about it. And you can have a huge impact uh, not by giving money, but by volunteering your time and helping out. And of course, that's more enabled uh, with the internet now that even things that you're not directly there, you can often help with. Um, taking math skills as an example, uh, I put together a group of people to do disease modeling uh, using Monte Carlo techniques. And it's amazing, these unbelievable math majors are willing to work on this project um, just because they see the, the potential. If you have good disease models, you'll understand how to intervene. You'll, uh, you'll make so much more progress when you have that. I do think a lot of people hesitate because picking is hard. You know, should you learn about malaria? Should you learn about childhood disease? Um, any one of those things would be worthwhile. So even if it's a little arbitrary picking what you're going to develop some expertise on, I do think that's a leap you have to take. Um, you know, some people like to choose one thing that's in their community uh, that they're involved in hands-on. And of course, there's lots of schools that aren't as good as they should be in the area. There's lots of social services things. I also like to encourage people to think about picking a cause that affects the poorest in the world and learn about that. And ideally, uh, some, sometime when they're young, get out and actually see it um, because that's what draws you in. It gives you the great picture of what's going on, a sense of it. And most of these things, once you see them, you'll be uh, sort of have a, a lifelong commitment to want to wanna make a difference. Over here. Uh, my name is Afshin. I'm an international student from Pakistan. Uh, and uh, I'm a senior at Pomona College. My question was uh, about the whole troublemaking thing. I, I really like the fact that you're a troublemaker. Um, we really need troublemakers and rebels throughout the world to bring about changes. Um, 
what do you have to say to a person who asks you why f devote all your energy and resources to fixing problems around the world when you have U.S. to take care of? Like, I I'm not complaining. I really like the fact. That <laughs> well, it's one human race, and the, the biggest impact per dollar is helping out the poorest. That is, when you do vaccines, you're saving a life for a few thousand dollars. And in addition, you reduce sickness, and by creating the healthy conditions, you, relate, you parents voluntarily choose to have smaller family size. So you're, you're allowing um, them to get into a, a situation that's stable. So vaccines, to me, just you know, are so clear. Um, you know, in the U.S., we, we spend a few million to save a life. And so the question is, are these lives worth more than a thousandth of uh, what a life in the U.S. is worth? Um, and if not, then fine, it's a, it's a bad use of money. Um, if you believe they're of equal value, then the, it's pretty clear you're getting uh, a dramatic effect. Also, something like a polio eradication is, is beneficial worldwide. The smallpox, smallpox was killing two million people a year. And then in, in 1975, it became the first, so far the only human disease, to be uh, fully eradicated. When we put the foundation together, we did decide that we should pick uh, and spend at least a quarter of the money in the United States and pick a thing that would be important for the United States. And we thought about that and, and ended up picking uh, education as our primary focus. Um, And that's, that's meant a lot of things. It's meant the uh, uh, getting internet access into libraries. Uh, there's a, a scholarship program uh, that I had the, the privilege of meeting some of the, the incredible recipients of, Gates Millennium Scholars, that we've done. Um, and, but the biggest piece now is trying to improve K through 12 education um, through teacher improvement systems, through use of technology. So we have a balance. Uh, we spend outside the U.S., we spend inside the U.S. Uh, if you were just on a pure impact per dollar, you would spend it all outside the U.S. But given that the luck of the fortune being made, both the Microsoft fortune and the Berkshire Hathaway uh, fortune, Warren Buffett's money is half the money in our foundation comes from him, uh, they, were, they came about because of the magic things in the United States where I was lucky to get a good education, and you know, it's an environment where young kids can take a risk and do new things. So we thought it made sense, even though uh, impact per dollar, it's not quite the same. And in education, it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, it's important. I do think we'll move forward. But it, when we invent a malaria vaccine, which I'm optimistic we will, you, no school board can vote to get rid of our malaria vaccine. Uh, <laughs> If you improve education, uh, it's subject to all sorts of complex factors uh, that you know, it might, might sustain itself and it might not. On the other side. My name is Joshua Ehrlich. I'm a senior computer science major at Harvey Mudd. Uh, and my question is, so you talked about some of the things you can do with computer science, uh, but in terms of how do you see technology, either from Microsoft or from Silicon Valley, being used to help people who are in the poorest of the poor? Uh, using the new technologies that we're designing. Yeah, the, the poorest have not yet benefited in any direct way from computer technology. Now, they have benefited indirectly when you have scientists collaborating and sharing genetic data to make a new vaccine or make vaccines less expensive. Uh, then that really helps the poor, or you're using computer technology to design new seeds. The thing that's quite phenomenal is our ability to simulate things on computers and develop deep understanding of materials, uh, biology. Uh, this is, you know, it's stunning how well this is developing. And it should mean the rate of innovation goes up. You know, worldwide, we're going to have more engineers. Um, many of them will be in Asia. We'd like more of them to be uh, in the United States as well. But the, world, the amount of IQ that's being tapped into and the way it collaborates, those very tools of innovation are, are improving as well. You know, the, the, 
biggest way to help the poorest is to, um, is to help them not be poor. Uh, that is to create economic conditions when they, they get richer. It's like when we, we took uh, my son down to this do thing, do uh, work to help homeless people, and he spent the day packaging up toothbrush and uh, these nice little kits for the people. And he said at the end of the day, he said, well, this was all nice, but if they're homeless, why don't we just get homes for them? Uh, <laughs> and so for the poorest, you want them not to be poor, basically. And, but what does it take to do that? It takes uh, agricultural productivity, it takes infrastructure, and you have to get health up to a certain level before any of those things can happen. Now, there are some things being played with in terms of uh, how you use cell phones, how you get uh, health information out, uh, some agricultural information. But as yet, the, most of those projects that look good on paper, and even in pilot studies look good, mostly so far the, the direct impact on the poorest has been quite small. Now we fund a, a number of these things, so I, I clearly believe that, uh, that that can be changed. Over here. Um, I'm Will. I'm a junior at Pomona. I'm a math chemistry major. Um, <clears throat> earlier you were talking about our budgetary problems and our problems with arithmetic. And I, you mentioned the need to reform health care. I was curious what you, thought, what you think should be done about defense spending. And I was wondering if you think that, um, uh, the, that the United States is doing uh, a good job in intervening militarily in uh, other countries, or if it should be strictly humanitarian intervention. <laughs> yeah, there's topics that I know more about and topics I know less about. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think the, the defense budget needs to shrink. Uh, I don't think it's going to shrink. It won't shrink dramatically enough to make room for these health care cost increases. There's just no way that you can attack, unless you get bend the curve on medical costs, it, it just, uh, you've got a huge problem. And the net effect of it is that you end up spending so much of society's resources on people past the age of, of 65, which is, is fine in a way, but what that means is that you're not reinvesting into the young. And if you look at state budgets and what's gone on over the last 20 years, the amount of money for education as a whole, particularly higher education, because that gets hit first, that's gone down. It's gone down uh, very substantially. California is a perfect example of this. You know, University of California system is an amazing set of colleges. You know, it's a public system that in many ways compares very well even to the very best private schools. It's really something, uh, particularly the, the, the top few campuses. And yet, with the tuition increases they've had and the reduction in funding, you might find over a period of 10 to 20 years that excellence um, may not renew itself because you're not, you're not backing it the way that, that you used to. So in terms of military things, obviously, I, you know, war is the biggest waste of money there is. And the theory that you can send your army over someplace and that somehow those people will like you better, I, I think that's a very <laughs> difficult theory. I mean, even if you didn't accidentally shoot a few people every once in a while. Uh, so I'm still trying to understand that one. Uh, they're going to like us. They're really going to like us. Because we're going to be there for a while, and then we're going to leave and we will have shot people. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, seriously, it's not an area of expertise uh, for, for me. Okay. okay, I know there are other students who would like to ask questions, but I'm afraid this is all the time we have for questions this afternoon. So I'd like to thank you, Mr. Gates, for the time you've spent on our campuses. And thank you, thank you, Maria, for making this event happen. Mr. Gates has to leave us now, but all of you are invited to join us on the South Portico, adjacent to the auditorium, for a light reception to continue your conversations about the interesting issues raised this afternoon. Thank you again all for coming.